Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. As you know, I'm sure, we're studying the Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath School lessons for the months of April, May, and June of 2013. It's a series, a very interesting series, entitled Major Lessons from Minor Prophets, and it's talking about those books from Hosea to Malachi at the end of the Old Testament as we know it. This particular lesson focuses on the last half of the book of Zechariah, and it's a, a very interesting seven chapters talking about prophecies pointing forward to the coming Messiah and even perhaps beyond that. And so this is lesson number 12 for June 22 of 2013. What are we supposed to learn from these apparent prophecies about the Messiah from the Old Testament. We hope you, you have your Bible handy. Um, if you don't, maybe you have a chance to get it in a moment. Right now, let's bow our heads together and let's pray. Our wonderful Father, we thank you for the revelations that you have given us in the Scriptures. And now as we read the last part of the book of Zechariah, sometimes referred to as the revelation of the Old Testament, Help us to see what you want us to see in these chapters, to see what you said and what you wanted to say about the Messiah so long ago, some 500 years before Jesus came to this earth. May we be able to understand what we read is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in the last seven chapters of Zechariah, there are a number of very famous, now famous, Messianic prophecies. Let us see if we can discover what these prophecies were supposed to teach us. When studying the works of a prophet, it is very important to look first of all at the prophet's situation and try to determine what his words must have meant to his original audience, his original readers and or listeners. For these last chapters of Zechariah, do you think it is clear to his listeners that these were Messianic prophecies? Were these prophecies full of hope? And that's the, one of the big questions we need to ask ourselves. Um, by the way, if you would like to look at the materials that we use in our discussions together, they're available on our website at www.theox, that's T-H-E-O-X, dot O-R-G. You'll find them quite interesting, I think, as we do. Most of these prophecies are prophecies events connected with the final week of Christ's life on this earth. Now, first question, why would God give a bunch of somewhat cryptic messages in this small book in the Old Testament, written 500 plus years before Jesus came to this earth, to say, tch, tch. and these events all seem to be directly connected with that final, very important week in the life of Christ. Is that trying to point something out to us? Well, one yes. thing's for sure, it keeps, it keeps you from thinking that when an event happens that it's not just a flash in the pants. I mean, mm -hmm. you can go back and, and read these things way back in time, and you say that there's something here that's, that's foundational, that's happening, and that's, that's something, a very important thing. Something God has been planning for for hundreds of years. That's right, that's right. And then he's even smart enough to sometimes make them when he f they first come out, they actually apply to something that happened right then, but then later on, way down through time, it happens again, only it's even more fantastic Bigger. because it's, it's, it's matching again. Mm -hmm. It's something uh, we don't, else. We don't have the words, but the, what Gary is saying, when Jesus went on the road to Emmaus, Mm -hmm. And he went through the Old Testament. He was going through this kind of information exactly. to tell those people that what he had just gone through. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting. You remember the story very briefly. It's in Luke 24. If you haven't read it recently, I think it starts with about verse 13, somewhere like that, and goes down through to 37. Maybe that's not exactly right. But the story is right there. And Jesus is walking along with these people, and he says, let me tell you uh, what it says about me in the Old Testament. Verse 44. 
And here we are. We're reading the Old Testament, and here are these things written about Jesus very clearly. And it's interesting to notice that after that, when the apostles began to preach their very, very powerful sermons, Peter's sermon at the, on the day of Pentecost, etc., what do they do? They follow this example <clears throat> that apparently Jesus preached to these two men on the road to Emmaus. Look at the Old Testament. Look at these verses. 500 years down, what do they point to? They point to exactly the events which happened in the life of Jesus of Nazareth. Do you think that was an accident? Hmm. No way. Hmm. Don't think so. <laughs> Don't think it was an accident. It so, was kind of fantastic that they were so, they became such, and, you know, um, what do you say, just um, authorities on yeah. these prophecies, you know, all of a sudden, if they would have known that when Jesus was here, mm -hmm. it seems like they would have acted different about what was going to come up. Mm -hmm. So somehow they got that information, and it's probably from Jesus. And, from, yeah. yeah, and this was so powerful to them that from that day forward, they went out and they said, we'll die for this message. Mm -hmm. And they did. But your question earlier was, uh, did these people, when these were given, mm -hmm. understand what it was about? Let's, uh, is it necessary? Well, let's, let's pick up a spot. Look at Zechariah 8, verses 4 and 5. This is, a, this is one that people have, have looked at and struggled with. And so it says, once again, old men and women, so old that they use a stick when they walk, will be sitting in the city squares, and the streets will again be full of boys and girls playing. Now, what does that have to do with prophecy? People will be safe sometime. It, you won't be threatened. There won't be any, there won't be crime. There won't be... Okay, well, talking about like this, that. the days we're living in. Yeah. Zechariah and Haggai were speaking to a group of people who were afraid to even try to build a church because there was so much opposition. And to think that the day would come when it would be perfectly safe for elderly people to be sitting in the city squares, watching children playing happily with no threat. I mean, this must, this must have been a dream to them. I mean, could that ever happen again? You know, think about their environment. So, let's go down, let's look at some of these prophecies. Um, one of the ones that the Jews really, I'm sure, even in our day, love to quote is found in Zechariah 14. And I, I'm going to start with verse, um, let's start with the first verse. The day when the Lord will sit in judgment is near. Then Jerusalem will be looted and the loot will be divided up before your eyes. I mean, he's not trying to suggest that everything's just going to be peaches and cream from now on. Mm. The Lord will bring all the nations together to make war on Jerusalem. The city will be taken and so forth. And at that time, verse 4, I'm dropping down, he will stand on the Mount of Olives to the east of Jerusalem. Then the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west by a large valley. Half the mountain will move northwards and half of, it, half of it southwards. You will escape through this valley that divides the mountain in two. You will flee as your ancestors did when the earthquake struck in the time of King Uzzah, I'm sorry, Uzziah of Judah. The Lord my God will come bringing all the angels with him. When that time comes, there will no longer be cold or frost or any darkness. There will always be daylight even at night time. When this will happen is known only to the Lord. Can we start to guess what time he's talking about? Third coming. Coming to the New Jerusalem. There's no way that that's happened any time before what we call now the third coming, at the end of the millennium. We know it's in the future. They knew it was in the future. It's hope for us. It yeah. was hope for them. <laughs> Why do you suppose God didn't say, oh, by the way, it's going to be a 500 years before Jesus comes, that's going to be at least 2,000 years before he comes again. There's going to be another 1,000 years before this thing you're talking about here. It would discourage them. Well, it would be a distraction too, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It would be a distraction. Well, and then he talks about all the marvelous things that will happen at that point in time. And look, look, at, look at chapter 8, verse 23. <laughs> in those days... 
10 foreigners will come to one Jew and say, we want to share in your destiny because we have heard that God is with you. Can you imagine what the Jews must have thought, that little tiny group of people who come back from Babylon in captivity, when they got a message like that? Has huh? that happened yet? Huh? Has that happened yet? Well, what about that? Has that happened yet? No. Mm -hmm. Now, many of our Christian friends believe what? Oh, it's all going to happen in Jerusalem. And Jesus is going to come down one day soon, and he's going to set up his headquarters in Jerusalem, and there's different versions about how this is going to happen. But then everybody is going to turn their attention to Jerusalem, and Jesus is going to lead us into a thousand years of peace and safety. I myself have a hard time figuring out how that's going to work. But <laughs> so, Well, it's interesting in this context to, to look at Comparing Isaiah with, I mean, comparing Zechariah with Isaiah 2 and Micah 4, which seems to suggest that someday the entire world will be drawn to Jesus Christ. Did Jesus ever say anything like that? Yes. Where would you find that? What about, look at, look at, it's a very interesting little story that takes place in John, the, 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 Twelfth uh, chapter. Twelve thirty-two. And well, let let's back up to twenty-eight. Jesus pray, preaches in the temple. He's preaching to a large group of people, and then something happens. A group of Gentiles send a message to Jesus, saying, "We want." Well, he tell they tell his disciples, "We want to see Jesus," and Jesus says, "This is a harbinger. This is a, a, a just a glimpse." of the future glory that's going to come to the Christian church. People from, people, when at my birth, people came from the east to learn about me. Now, almost at my death, people are coming from the west to learn about me. And look at verse 28. Father, Jesus says, bring glory to your name. Then a voice spoke from heaven. I have brought glory to it, and I will do so again. The crowd standing there heard, heard the voice, and some of them said it was thunder, while others said, an angel spoke to him. But Jesus said to them, these are his words, it was not for my sake that this voice spoke, but for yours. Now is the time for this world to be judged. When's that going to happen? Now the ruler of this world will be overthrown. We read about the Satan, the adversary, the opponent being overthrown last time. When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to me. Now if you had... If you have a King James, one of the, ancient, one of the older versions, it, will, it might say all men. But you will notice the little men is italics, mean, meaning the word was supplied. Drop it out, I will draw all to me. And we don't think that word belongs there because look at this very interesting passage from Ellen White. This is found in Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 68 and 69. But the plan of redemption had a yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. Broader and deeper? I thought that's what this was all about, saving man. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. You mean there's something going on involving the entire universe that's going on right here? To this result of his great sacrifice, its influence upon the intelligence of other worlds, as well as upon man, don't, we, we're not left out, the Savior looked forward when just before his crucifixion he said, now he says, I'm looking for something that's going to impact the entire universe. So what does he say? Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. And Ellen White leaves out the word men. John 12, 31 and 32. But I will have to tell you, if you have a later printing of Patriarchs and Prophets, you will find that some editor sometimes felt it was necessary to put the word men back in there. Ellen White left it out. The act of Christ in dying for the salvation of man would not only make heaven accessible to men, 
but before all the universe, it would justify God and His Son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. It would establish the perpetuity of the law of God, His government, in other words, the basis for His government, and would reveal the nature and results of sin. Wow! How's that for making a bigger picture? So how successful is he at drawing all unto him? Well, that's a question we have to struggle with. It says, though, when, when he is lifted up, mm -hmm. not by himself, but by somebody else, mm -hmm. that's us. Mm -hmm. So maybe the question is, has anybody really lifted him up yet? Yeah. Well, not, he was lifted up on the cross at one that, time. Yeah. People lift him up, but also... Was it Colossians 1, 19 and 20 mm -hmm. and the Ephesians 1, 9 and 10? Yep. When at the fullness of time, the beings in the heavenly places got the message. Galatians 4, 4, Galatians 6, 16, Matthew 24, 14, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Ephesians 1, 7 and 10. The verses you mentioned. There's lots of places that say what is happening right here on planet Earth is supposed to teach the entire universe the essential truths that they need to learn <coughs> for all eternity. Is now, it, yeah, go ahead. Is it safe to say they did not understand this, neither did they understand the notion of the branch that would take away the sin of all men in one? We're coming to that. Oh, okay. okay. That's amazing. Like Micah 6, 8, remember, what, what are we supposed to bring to God? We're supposed to, I mean, it's not rivers of oil, it's not lamb, many, many thousands of lambs, it's what? A broken heart, a contrite and humble heart, etc. Zechariah 8, 16 and 70 suggests that the way we treat others impacts our relationship with God. God hates lying, injustice, and violence. Do the universalists, the people who believe that everybody is going to be saved, use this text, draw all unto me? I don't think so. Well, they don't. <laughs> I don't think so. Well, they could. Potentially, yeah. Okay, <laughs> now let's look at some of these prophecies. Look at Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice, rejoice, people of Zion. Shout for joy, your, you people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He comes triumphant and victorious, but humble, riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Is that clearly a messianic prophecy? To us it is. What, what, does it, what does it immediately bring to our minds as Christians? The triumphal entry. Triumphal. The triumphal entry. So we would say, yeah. Now, let's be honest. To the ancient Jews, this was, from the times of David, recognized as the way a king would, at, at his coronation, enter Jerusalem. So they wouldn't have, think, they wouldn't have thought this was exclusively the story about Jesus. We might be inclined to think that, but this was a standard thing, okay? You know, in and this case, though, Jesus, who knew the Scriptures pretty well, could read that, and it would almost be a cue for him mm -hmm. to call for the cult yeah. to, to fulfill the prophecy. Yeah. So that would be an interesting it's angle a little, to look a, at. It. A little hard to organize the thousands of people around, crowding around and putting their, putting their clothes down and the branches and so forth. I, I think it was pretty natural. Why riding on a donkey? Why not a horse like we might today? Well, there's a couple of reasons. You don't see donkeys operating in war. Why do you suppose that is? Too bullheaded. <laughs> Too, that would be more, 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 more of a mule. <laughs> donkeys are slow. They're not fast. They're, they're quiet. They, do, they just quietly go about their job. Horses are, you know, charging in there and brandishing your sword and this kind of stuff. No, that's not the way God works. Not by might nor by power. Remember Zechariah 4, 6? Well, but was that the case for, like, King David? If he came in on a, on a donkey? Well, um, in, in, Would that be the same reasoning there? Or well, is it more of a culture thing? Well, it may have been partially a cultural thing as well. That's a possibility. This was recognized as the way that kings in, in the David's line would come to the, come to the kingdom. Because you could get a gentle horse. Yeah. There are gentle horses, too. Yeah. <laughs> they still have the potential to go into battle, though. But yeah. let, let's, let's come to the, the story of Jesus now, just briefly. 
we don't, this is not primarily focused on that. What do you think the people there on, 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 on um, that march on that Sunday morning, that triumphal entry, what do you think they were thinking as Jesus rides this donkey up over the top of Mount Manoa? It's going to happen. It, it, finally. Finally. It's gonna finally, he, he's going to let us make him king, right? Yep. Well, while the followers of Jesus were poor in terms of this world's goods, they were very rich in their hope for the future. They were more than happy to place their garments on the ground to allow the colt carrying Jesus to walk over them. The triumphal entry came five days before Jesus was crucified. Five days from that to the crucifixion. While there will, be, will there ever be a time just before this world come to an end when Christians will seem to be triumphant and the true people of God will be honored? I mean, if that was the story of Jesus just before he's crucified, might that story be repeated? Tell me about it. <laughs> well, many things about the life of Christ seem to be, have been, have been or and are being repeated in the history of the Christian church. And I'm just asking, is it possible that there will be a time that the church, God's true church, will seem to be having a glorious effect on the world and maybe many people are converted and so forth and then psh, this rapid change. Okay, it's the time of Jacob's trouble or the tribulation is what you're thinking of it then. Yep. Okay. Aren't well, we told in Revelation <clears throat> that, there, that everyone will follow the beast, there will be a great evangelistic campaign, everyone will It'll everyone see. will follow this Messiah, the false Christ. Yes, yes. It will seem like Christianity is making great strides, right? Well, there's a possibility, I don't know if it's true or not, but there's a possibility that the reason the people were so excited might have been a power coming down from heaven, making them excited. Um, and Jesus said that if he silences those people, then the stones would start start um, rejoicing. Mm -hmm. So I'm getting to wonder if maybe that power, if the people weren't doing it, the stones would start well, actually doing it. Yeah. We, we, I think we all would recognize the fact that God, especially in that last week of his life here on this earth, didn't waste a single moment doing, you know, unrelated things. He, he knew what he was doing. He knew exactly, he knew when he got to the brim of that will, at that uh, brim of that hill, that he was going to stop and he was going to break out in tears. He knew step by step exactly every step what, what was going to happen. Somewhere, uh, can I have gotten the, uh, the idea or the impression that uh, at the end of time, the experience of, of God's people would be very much like the experience of, of Jesus. Jesus. Now, is there, is that, that that he went through? Is that, yes. is that uh, you know, I can't, I can't lay my hands right now on on, on there are a number text of passages. Or, or passages, there but, passages but that's, suggesting that. Yeah, that, the, the, that the Christian, at the end of time, the Christians who are faithful in these troublous times, they will be experiencing pretty much the same, but they may be on a cross, but they will have their own, their own uh, Let, troubles. Jesus had to, to die, and he had to go, go through all of, be willing to die to accomplish his purpose. <laughs> It might well be that those who are going to be translated, I mean, the laws of the land have said the day that they can be executed, the wicked will be around them, jeering and carrying on, and even trying to do it early. Satan will be doing everything possible Absolutely. to eliminate the righteous. It'll look like they're going down, but they don't give up. They go through that and gloriously come out the other side. Let's look at another prophecy. Zechariah 12, verse 10. I will fill the descendants of David and the other people of Jerusalem with the spirit of mercy and the spirit of prayer. They will look at the one whom they stabbed to death. Now the traditional translation says they pierced. And they will mourn for him like those who mourn for an only child. Does that, is that clearly a messianic prophecy? When, where does piercing come into the, Messian, the story of Jesus? When the Roman pierced his side. 
and Jesus was alive or dead? Dead. He was dead? He's already dead. They stuck a spear in his side to see if he was really dead. Yeah. By the way, who reports that? Uh, well, let me just mention the Old Testament context. There's a couple places where this same word for piercing is used. Numbers 25.8 talks about um, the priest, the descendant of, of, of Aaron, that at the time of that great, re terrible rebellion, in, in just before they crossed the Jordan River, and they were all these guys were carrying on with those women from the Moabite women and so forth. And one guy, they were moaning and starting to read, I mean, mourning the, the terrible apostasy. And this guy comes marching right through the crowd with this beautiful Moabite princess and walks into his tent. And what did, what did the priest do? He grabbed his spear, went charging into the tent and stuck it right through both of them. And that's the same word that's used here for Jesus. Another time when, the, when it's used is, is, is the case when, when Saul had been terribly wounded, uh, 1 Samuel 31, 4, and he turned to his armor bearer and said, please kill me so these wicked Philistines won't kill me. And that's the word again. Uh, but in the New Testament now, who, who, who tells us about the piercing of Jesus? John did, didn't he? Only, only John. Why do you suppose it's only John that talks about that? He was the only one there. He was the only disciple that was there. John 19, 37, he talks about it in context. And then later, in Revelation 1, 7, he says something very interesting. Look, he is coming on the clouds. Everyone will see him, including those who pierced him. All peoples on earth will mourn over him. So shall it be. So guess what? We just read, all peoples will mourn over him. What happens over in Revelation? Quote, straight from the book of Zechariah. What about the nails? Is that, does that fit for piercing also? Uh, potentially, but um, I think it more is referring to the, the stabbing, which of course, Jesus was already dead. So, as we've seen them so far, do these sound like pretty clear messing out of prophecies or are these just Bible writers just grabbing expressions from the Old Testament? Let's try another one while you're thinking about that. Look at chapter 13, verses 7 to 9. The Lord Almighty says, Wake up, sword, and attack the shepherd who works for me. Kill him, and the sheep will be scattered. I will attack my people, and throughout the land two-thirds of the people will die. I will test the third that survives and will purify them as silver is purified by fire. I will test them as gold is tested. Then they will pray to me, and I will answer them. I will test them. I, I'm sorry. I will tell them that they are my people, and they will confess that I am their God. What's that talking about? Reminds you <laughs> of the Walden Seas. <laughs> Reminds you of the Walden Seas. Okay. We talk about the, strep, the shepherd being struck and his, the sheep scattered. Does that fit any part of the story of Jesus? Well, mm -hmm. his disciples and all his friends ran. Mm -hmm. So at least that part of one sentence seems to fit. But the rest of the context sounds like he's talking about something completely different, doesn't it? Okay. They've got a habit of talking about two things at once. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There's an interesting fulfillment of that, uh, that prophecy. Look at uh, Mark 27, I'm sorry, Mark 14, verse 27. Jesus said to them, speaking to his disciples, all of you will run away and leave me, for the scripture says, God will kill the shepherd and the sheep will, be all, will all be scattered. Guess where he's quoting from? Here. Right there. And what was the result? A few hours later, drop down to verse 50. Then all the disciples left him and ran away. And there's an interesting little footnote. A certain young man, dressed only in a linen cloth, was following Jesus. They tried to arrest him, but he ran away naked, leaving the cloth behind. Why do you suppose that's only found in the book of Mark? Because it was Mark. <laughs> it was his story. Yeah. It was his story. I'm sure it was his story. He says, I got, I got to put just a little bit of me in that story, right? Um, now, did Jesus know these things were going to happen to him? 
Because he read Zechariah and these Old Testament prophecies, or do you, do you did think, he okay. know otherwise and is now using the prophecies to show that Jesus learned? Did he know, you know, be, I guess questioning his foreknowledge here or something, mm -hmm. but did he know already and, and is now using the scriptures these old, these old Testament prophecies to show, to validate, or did he have to kind of learn what was going to happen to him and got that information from the Old Testament prophecies? It would be my understanding, and this is, I believe, very clearly supported from Scripture. It's certainly supported very extensively by Ellen White that Jesus spent evenings and early mornings talking with his father. Sometimes he prayed entire nights. This wasn't just down on his knees mumbling things to the Father. They were having conversations. They were planning day by day exactly what he would do every day. And if we believe 1 Corinthians 10, 4, Luke 24, 44, John, 5, uh, John um, 5, 38, 30, especially 39, the Old Testament Jesus was the leader in the Old Testament. So if we believe the Bible, then Jesus here is fulfilling the prophecies that he himself gave to these prophets okay. back in the Old Testament. That would be my most straightest so answer. So that when he, when he was here on earth, he already he knew they were there. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Well, I think he gave up that knowledge, and yeah. he learned them the way a human would have to learn them in his life, by interaction with his father, by prayer and Bible study. Uh, that, that would be my perception as well, but yeah. I think the question needs to be asked, and uh, you need to wonder at yourself. Yeah. And I think the first inclination I have in that is, perhaps it's what Ellen White mentions, when that visit to the temple when he was 12 years old, he was beginning to see from those the meaning of that sacrificial system and how it was going to, yeah. how, how his yep. part played in it. His part in it. Yep. Yeah. Well, uh, look at you, the... I think you phrased that very well. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what it said. <laughs> well, just a moment ago about oh, yeah. how, you know, how, yeah. he, how he gave that knowledge up and he yeah. had to learn it once Do again. these Messianic prophecies in Zechariah give you hope today? And if so, why? I mean, are these, are these just interesting historical notes, or, or, or did God put these in here for a very specific reason? They're put there so that when it happens, we can look at it and understand what it means. Okay. And we can get tremendous hope and joy from these messianic prophecies by looking at how they were fulfilled. Why? You're right. I, let, yeah. let's, let's nail that down. God knows the future. Okay, we are saying this is proof that God can predict the future Absolutely. far in advance. Absolutely. If you read Isaiah, chapters 40 through 55, and you look in there, and it was, Isaiah will say again and again and again two things. Proof that you're talking about the only real God, sort of like, will the real God please stand up? Uh, the proof that you know that this is the real God is two things. One, he can create out of nothing. And two, he can predict far in advance. So we can look at these events and we say, there is a prediction, and here hundreds of years later is the fulfillment. Right. No, human, no human being can do that. You did not even a group of human beings can do that. With this has to be God, and there's and He has to be have the capacity to predict the future. Did the writer, did Zechariah, know that these were predictions about the future? Probably not. Well, let me read some words from Ellen White. Think about this. Maybe it'll give us a hint. In the darkest days of her long conflict with evil, the Church of God has been given revelations of the eternal purpose of Jehovah. His people have been permitted to look beyond the trials of the present to the triumphs of the future, when the warfare having been accomplished, 
the redeemed will enter into possession of the promised land. The, these visions of future glory, scenes pictured by the hand of God, should be dear to his church today. When the controversy of the ages is rapidly closing and the promised blessings are soon to be realized in all their fullness. The nations of the saved will know no other law than the law of heaven. All will be a happy united family, clothed with the garments of praise and thanksgiving. Over the scene, the morning stars will sing together and the sons of God will shout for joy. That sounds familiar. Where do those words come from? Job 38, 7. And what was the context there? Creation. Creation. So what he's saying here, what Ellen White is saying to us now, just as the angels rejoiced over creation, they're now going to rejoice over the recreation, right? While God and Christ will unite in proclaiming that there shall be no more sin, neither shall there be any more death. That's Patriarch, I'm sorry, Prophets and Kings 722 and then a portion from 732, 732 and 733. Does that answer your question, Gordon? <laughs> Do you think it does? <laughs> no, I didn't think it does. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, here's, 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 here's what, I wanna, what I think we need to see here. We've already suggested that these prophecies of Zechariah, not only, many of them, point forward to pretty specific events happening in the life of Christ. They're also pointing forward to very specific events that are going to happen at the second coming, and other events are going to happen not until the third coming. Now, if I look at these predictions back here, and I see, whoa, look at that. Every one of those is filled, fulfilled exactly. And then I go, oh, I wonder if these are going to be fulfilled. I wonder if those over there are going to be fulfilled. What conclusion should we come to? They absolutely will be. Absolutely. Not one has failed yet. But that still doesn't mean that either Zechariah knew or his initial readers knew that mm -hmm. these were yeah, what, what sure? they meant. Are you sure that they knew exactly what was going to be fulfilled? In Zechariah's day? No, or when? To well, you were talking about Zechariah's right day, weren't you? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think I, I think it's very well, likely. You were asking, yeah, would okay. Zechariah have any idea about today? Yeah. No, I, I'm asking if Zechariah knew that these were messianic prophecies, and also did Zechariah's initial readers or listeners know that these were messianic prophecies? As opposed to just thinking just they applied here today. Just something for uh, our. Mm -hmm. You know, for were they even for looking Israel, for the Messiah for back then? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, well, absolutely. A different if they Messiah. were looking for it, they, don't you think it would come into their mind yes. to look for things that the prophets are saying that may yeah. point to that actually happening? I mean, they have they have Daniel who wrote roughly a hundred years before Zechariah. They have Micah who wrote what a couple hundred years before, and he said, there in Bethlehem he's going to be born. We have other prophecies all the way back to Genesis 3.15 that says, you know, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna bruise the head of this serpent. So they could be understanding, if not just a shadow of what it really meant, but they're holding on to it, and, and it's something that gives them courage yeah. you know, for the future. Well, in, in that larger context, what kind of response do we get when we read God said this here, and look what happened there, and look what's going to happen here, and look what's going to happen. Should that give us hope? Absolutely. This is what Ellen White says about how God feels specifically about the salvation of one soul. I'm reading now Review and Herald, April 1, 1880. One soul saved in the kingdom of God is worth more than 10,000 worlds like this. We think our world is pretty valuable, right? It's going to be the future kingdom of God. Then later, one soul is of infinite value, for Calvary speaks to its worth. Gospel Workers 92, page 337, paragraph 1. And then in volume 2 of the Testimonies, page 246, paragraph 1, one soul saved to live throughout the ages of eternity, to praise God and the Lamb is of more value than millions in money. And then... Finally, 8T 72.1, Christ would have died for one soul in order that that one might live through the eternal ages. 
I, I'd like to rephrase that just a little bit. Okay. Christ would have died for my one sin. Yes. I mean, I can look at any one of my numerous sins mm -hmm. and say that Christ would have died for that particular one. Mm -hmm. What yeah. a glorious thought that, that he would come and demonstrate that kind of goodness to save us. Okay, in the few minutes we have, great. In the few minutes we have left, let's look at these Messianic prophecies, the ones we haven't looked at yet, real quickly. Going all the way back to Zechariah 3, verses 8 to 10. Listen then, Joshua, you who are the high priest, and <clears throat> listen, you fellow priests of his, you that are the sign of a good future. I will reveal my servant who is called the branch. Does that sound familiar? I am placing in front of you, Joshua, a single stone with seven facet, facets, a single stone. I will engrave an inscription on it, and, and in a single day I will take away the sin of this land. When that day comes, each of you will invite his neighbor to come and enjoy peace and security, surrounded by your vineyards and fig trees. So, what do we have here? We have my, my servant. Jesus is called God's servant. He's called the branch. He's called the stone. Isaiah 11, 1. Mm -hmm. There was a rabbi uh, years ago, about 30 some years ago, and he, when he was reading through Isaiah, and he came to Isaiah 11, 1. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And he re recognized that as, as yeah. referring to Yeshua or Jesus. So why, why does it talk about it like that? A, a branch growing out of a dead stump? Hmm. Nobody has an idea? Never thought of it. Uh, okay, what happened? David had been promised that the future Messiah would come from his line, right? Mm -hmm. And then they went into captivity. They went into captivity. What happened to David's line? Well, Zerubbabel came back, and I, we don't have time to go through all the history, but eventually his line died out completely. They had nothing to do with ruling the land. Uh, a bunch of priests rose to power. The, the, people in, in, the, the, the people who ruled Jerusalem more or less in Jesus' day, apart from the Romans, of course, were, were the high priests. And they came from the priestly line. They had nothing to do with the descendants of David. But then one stray branch came out of Bethlehem and grew up in Galilee. And he ends up being not only the priest, but the king who's going to rule for how long? Forever. For the rest of eternity. One little branch. I'm sure all of us at some time or another have seen a tree that's been cut down. You think that thing is completely gone. And then there's this one straggly little thing. And if you leave it there long enough, yeah. it's going to be a huge tree. That's right. Okay. So it fits perfect, right? Okay. Second Messianic promise, prophecy. Look at Zechariah 6, 12 and 13. Some of the same language. Tell him that the Lord Almighty says, the man who is called the branch will flourish where he is and rebuild the Lord's temple. He is the one who will build it and receive the honor due to a king, and he will rule his people. So, what do we see here? We see, well, let me read the rest of 13. A priest will stand by his throne, and they will work together in peace and harmony. Now, in Zechariah's day, they probably immediately would have jumped on this and said, here's the rubble, and here's Joshua, right? Mm -hmm. But, in the larger context, in the bigger context, we say the branch in my, my Bible here, my Good News Bible from the American Bible Society, has the word branch capitalized. Why did they do that? Because they think it's it capitalized. It's capitalized, the RSV? Mm -hmm. Okay. Clearly, they recognize this as referring to Jesus in light of the earlier passage there. Okay. What does the, the stone has seven eyes? What is the implication of that? Uh, I didn't take time to look at that, but if you get our hand out and you look at it carefully, there, especially when the book of Revelation, there's a number of places where it talks about the seven spirits of God, and it talks about eyes going all over the world, keep, uh, all over the universe for that matter, keeping track of everything that God is doing and so forth. Mm -hmm. So this fits, I think, with that. Okay. So it's, it's like seven eyes, Pointing There's out there. Seven eyes around the lamb, too, mm -hmm. in Revelation. Yep. So. Yep. 
Okay, the next prophecy. So we can see that that prophecy has probably a local application and later a much larger application, right? Next, let's come to the next one. The third messianic, messianic prophecy, we've looked at this briefly, Zechariah 9, 9 and 10. And here's the one, he's humble, riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The Lord says, I will remove the war chariots from Israel, take the horses from Jerusalem, the bows used in battle will be destroyed, your king will make peace among the nations, he will rule from sea to sea, from the river Euphrates to the ends of the earth. Now I hope you're starting to see a pattern develop here. We say, clearly, this is Jesus. This must refer to Jesus, the donkey thing. But then what happens in verse 10? And we should have seen it in the last prophecy. What happens? Rules from sea to sea. He rules from sea to sea. That's not talking about Jesus. All the nations. At the first coming. But how was Zechariah supposed to know that? How were the children of Israel supposed to know that? They would read this and say, the Messiah is coming, he's going to ride on a donkey, the colt, the foal of a donkey, and what's he going to do? He's going to rule the world. He's going to get rid of war chariots. He's, he's going to, I mean, he's going to rule the world. We shouldn't blame those people for thinking that the Messiah was going to come and do what they thought he was going to do. And that's why the disciples wanted to be, know who was going to be vice president and who yeah. was going to be secretary of treasury and et yep. cetera, et cetera. Well, look at an, another Messianic prophecy. Look at Zechariah chapter 10. And look specifically at verse 4. From among them will come rulers, leaders, and commanders to govern my people. Who do you think that's talking about? Maybe I should back up to verse 3. The Lord says, I am angry with those foreigners who rule my people, and I'm going to punish them. The people of Judah are mine, and I, the Lord Almighty, will take care of them. They will be my powerful war horses. From among them will come rulers, leaders, commanders to govern my people. Is that obviously a messianic prophecy? You know, we have in some of our teachings as a church that, what is the famous, the famous phrase, the Lord would have come Air this. Air this, head, and so on and so forth. So, if, if Israel had, um, in, in Zechariah's day, if they had snapped to here, is it, isn't it conceivable that this would have come, these very things would have come true in, in, in their day? At the time of the first coming. Well, I brought, if, it, if it's, wouldn't the, first, I, I, wouldn't the first coming have been earlier, or, or would, the, would the first coming have been different? Uh, does that have anything to do with the fact that it's been almost 170 years since 1844 and he still hasn't come? Are we not doing our job? We're not supposed to go off that direction. <laughs> 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 well, clearly here, the children of Israel, the people in Zechariah's day, said, okay, give us rulers. You know, powerful rulers can lead us into, if necessary, into battle and so forth and help us conquer the world. But I don't think that's what God had in mind. We've gone over several things here mm -hmm. that would reasonably make us think that those people in that day did not understand the way we see it today. We're told that unless we have the Spirit of God in our hearts, in our minds, in our study, mm -hmm. we will miss the message. Very likely. Is that their problem? Yes. Just like our problem today. Yes. So they didn't understand it because they... Well, not... They didn't understand it enough to change their lives and live according to it. But they had, they had opportunity yes. to. Mm -hmm. And because of their mindset, because they were not driven by the Spirit of God, they missed it. Well, in this context, this passage, if you look at one of the 10.4, and, and going back up to verse 3, there's, there's two or three key words, and it, it depends on which version you're reading. Jesus is called the cornerstone, 
th that would be the foundation. Remember, Jesus himself said the, the stone that the builders rejected, and he's referring to himself, remember? And then he's called a tent peg. What's the purpose of a tent peg? Hold up the tent. Kind of keep it in wind. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's got to stick in its place, or otherwise it's useless, right? Right. It's got to be solid, and, and you, can, you can hang your, your righteousness on him. You can, you can depend on this tent peg. Then he's called the battle bow. He's a divine warrior. It's a, it's a symbol of strength. And finally, he is the absolute or sovereign ruler. We read about the rulers a little bit. So once again, we could see that this could be, you know, easily applied to the Messiah, but it easily could have been interpreted as something in their day as well. Look at next, the fifth Messianic prophecy. Look at Zechariah 11, starting with verse 4. The Lord my God said to me, act the part of the shepherd of a flock of sheep that are going to be butchered. Does that sound exciting? Their owners kill them and go unpunished. They sell the meat and say, praise the Lord, we are rich. Even their own shepherds have no pity on them. Does that sound like a messianic prophecy? Is that the way God treats us? Yeah. Well, the Lord, Yahweh, there's the word, verse 6, said, I will no longer pity anyone on earth. I myself will put all the people in the power of their rulers. These, those rulers will devastate the earth and I will not save it from their power. God has given up on us. Elsewhere called his wrath. I see. Well, those who bought and sold the sheep hired me and I became the shepherd of the sheep that were going to be butchered. I took two sticks and, and we don't have time to go through all that. But if you drop down to verse 12 and 13, I said to them, if you are willing, give me my wages, but if not, keep them. So they paid me 30 pieces of silver as my wages. And all of a sudden we say, oh, mm -hmm. Judas. Judas got 30 pieces of silver for betraying Jesus, right? The Lord said to me, reading on verse 13, the Lord said to me, put them in the temple treasury. So I took the 30 pieces of silver, the magnificent sum they thought I was worth, and put them in the temple treasury. Then I broke the second stick and so forth and so forth. Okay, and all of a sudden we say, oh yeah, what happened to those 30 pieces of silver? Judas came back and he threw them down. They said, we can't, we can't keep those here in the temple treasury. We've we got we to gotta use them. This is blood money. And where did the money come from? Yeah. Them. <laughs> Probably out of the temple treasury. <laughs> Probably out of the temple treasury, exactly. So, what about that? Is that a messianic prophecy? Well, is there's it sure used? connection to it, that's for sure. Sure seems is, to be. Is it used by one of the other New Testament writers? Yes. Then they being inspired used it that way, so we have a right to. So here's the question. Do these biblical New Testament writers just pick up phrases from the Old Testament that, that they like and they're convenient for their use? Or is this really very specifically a New Testament, pro I mean, a messianic prophecy? If they do it under the Spirit of God, under the Holy Spirit, give I, don't, I give them permission to you do You give that. them permission. Okay, we've got one more. Look at Daniel. Uh, Zach I recall that Paul reinterpreted some things yes. from the Old Testament and had a new spin on it. Mm -hmm. the, the last of the prophecies is the one we've already looked at. They will look at the one whom they stabbed to death and they, did, they will mourn for him like those who mourn for an only child. And Jesus specifically quotes that passage. Remember? Yeah. I'm sorry, there's one more. And we've already looked at that. Zechariah 13, 6 and 7. This prophecy concerning the way that the Messiah's feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, Zechariah 14, 4 and 5, goes beyond the scope of the first coming of Jesus Christ. Even though Jesus Christ walked on the Mount of Olives during his first coming, the prediction proclaims that the Mount of Olives will be split in two. Has that happened yet? Not yet. Is it going to happen at the second coming? No. No, because his feet aren't even going to touch the ground, according to 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17. It has to be at the third coming. And did Zechariah understand that? I doubt it. Mm, very unlikely. Well, does it increase your trust in Scripture to know that God could predict hundreds of years in advance? Now we're talking thousands of years. This prophecy, if we go from that prophecy, even assuming Jesus comes very soon now, 
from that prophecy to the third coming, how many years are we talking? 3,500 years. 3,500 years. But using the thousand years for a day that it is to God, that's only three and a half days. Don't <laughs> worry about half, it. Three and a half days. Okay. But the point is, God can see those events down there <clears throat> very clearly, and he predicts it exactly the way it's going to happen. Exactly. Well, <clears throat> we have seen that there are <clears throat> several books. In this case, we've been focusing on Zechariah and the Old Testament. We could look at Ezekiel. We could look at Daniel. We could see many passages from the Old Testament prophesying things that are fulfilled in the New Testament and things still to be fulfilled in our day, right? Or in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, why do you suppose those books are quoted so frequently? Does, works. We're supposed, we're supposed to, they're supposed to teach us something, yeah? Right. Yeah. So what have we learned from Zechariah in our last two weeks' lessons? A lot of prophecies that uh, mm -hmm. became fulfilled. Yes. A, an encouragement to the people who were, who had almost given up. They? they had come back from Babylonian captivity. They seemed like they were a very small group. God is encouraging them to build a temple because in this temple marvelous things are going to happen, right? So it was encourage the people of that day, and it's going to go on to be a, a thing for us to look at and say, look at that. God knew. God knew. He predicted it. It happened exactly the way he predicted, and that should strengthen our faith. We hope you've enjoyed our discussion of the book of Zechariah as much as we've enjoyed putting it all together. Do you, are you more inclined now to believe in biblical prophecy? Are you more inclined to believe that God can predict the future? Are you more inclined to believe that He is God? Who else could predict something happening thousands of years in advance? We spent a lot of time working on these prophecies, studying these books. We hope that you find the materials useful, and you can go to our website and find them if you'd like to look at them again. Bless you. See you next week. Thank mm -hmm. you.